Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, we've just published a paper in the uh, Vestnik of uh, St. Petersburg State University, which covers a lot of the detail uh, and a lot more detail than I'll be giving. So you can see me afterwards to get the details. Uh, I'll just try and skip over the, um, the key points. <clears throat> Well, in the paper I start off by musing about the pace of scientific change. And as you all know, I'm changing those slides. Okay, please. Um, I've got to change it. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the great Max Planck uh, noted that scientific truth doesn't triumph by convincing its opponents, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, can we afford to wait? We know the rate of rise of chronic disease at the moment. One thing that uh, other speakers haven't spoken about is the number of co comorbid chronic diseases, which is the bottom right-hand graph there. 49% of US adults have at least one chronic disease. 49% of US adults have one. but 24% have more than one chronic diagnosis. It's a very sad state indeed. So what went wrong? Well, I'm not going to start sounding off on FDA. We've spent 10 years filing and, and trying to get uh, through FDA. So I'll let uh, the Commissioner, Margaret Hamburg, uh, give her feelings. Um, she said that FDA regulatory science is relying on 20th century approaches for the review approval and oversight of the treatments and cures of the 21st century. Well, you know, there's a trick to this because the key part of what she talks about is at the start, she talks about something called regulatory science. But regulatory science is an oxymoron. Regulations are fixed, codified and absolute, while science is constantly changing, constantly adapting. Either you have regulation or you have science. Either you have regulators or you have scientists. And unfortunately, in the last 10 years at the FDA, I've seen all of the scientists that I respected leave and go to other jobs. I just have to emphasize that the emphasis has shifted to regulatory functions rather than scientific functions. So what does this mean? Well, it means that when a real breakthrough comes along, FDA doesn't know what a real breakthrough looks like. In, 31 years ago, um, I uh, was a visiting scientist at the, um, the Department of Surgery at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And this was my boss, uh, Dr. Mike Albissa. And we were working on the early insulin infusion infuser uh, projects. We did all of the, all of the early uh, insulin infuser algorithms and all that technology was developed uh, in the group of which I was part. And Mike headed it all up and he put together all of that knowledge, 30 years of knowledge, into a computer program to make it easier for diabetics to change their dose, to figure out when to inject and how much to inject so as to uh, minimise their uh, HbA1c and uh, uh, optimise or minimise side effects. They published a paper on it. There was a, he did a controlled trial to uh, give data for the paper. FDA says, no, you cannot distribute that software. At that point, he was distributing it on USB sticks. He formed a company um, with a small uh, offshoot of pharma to do a, a phone app for it. Uh, after half a dozen uh, applications to FDA, they weren't getting anywhere. The company has folded, and that effort has stopped too. FDA just says no for a mathematical algorithm <laughs> that is very basic, but nevertheless help, but must help uh, many uh, diabetics who uh, sometimes can tend to be quite mathematically challenged. Another example my colleague, uh, Prof. Uh, Alex Politeyev in Moscow. And after the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, Alex began the development of a mass screening assay to, to try and determine which of the victims were most likely to develop disease. He developed an ELISA test, 
which is a very good potential base for PPPM, in my opinion. It uses a standard 96-well uh, ELISA um, a slide, 96-well uh, ELISA, which can be run from machinery anywhere in the world. And this is what it produces. It produces uh, a profile of, uh, of natural autoantibodies. Now, these are not autoantibodies associated with disease. These are natural autoantibodies that healthy people carry around. And that alone is very interesting and, and, and somewhat of a breakthrough. But uh, this particular slide shows a marker of vasculitis, which is elevated in, in one patient. On the next slide, we have a marker against the insulin receptor, autoantibody against the insulin receptor, uh, a risk of uh, prediabetes. Well, OK, this is great. Let's just screen the patients. Let's make this uh, ELISA available so that we can give our patients some idea of what they might have to worry about and, indeed, what we have to worry about. Well, there's a problem, and that is that diagnostic testing is regulated by diagnosis. That means every one of those potential markers that were used on the Chernobyl survivors, every one of Politeo's uh, markers, has to be run separately through a separate approval procedure at the FDA. The FDA has no concept of multi-disease predictive testing, even though 24% of American adults have more than one diagnosis. So um, the majority leader of the New Jersey State Senate uh, and the deputy speaker of the New Jersey General Assembly uh, got together and wrote a petition or wrote a request to Commissioner Hamburg to speak with me about PPPM, multiple diagnosis, uh, 21st century science. Uh, the meeting was refused by Commissioner Hamburg. She uh, didn't refer me to any of her staff, although I got an email two days ago from Dr. Jesse Goodman, the FDA chief scientist, who confirmed that FDA sees its role as uh, moderating the claims of the pharma industry for drugs which treat a single indication and have no interest in, in science. So, OK, Prof. Polite have made some breakthroughs. Um, we have two. This is the eminent medical journal, The Economist, from <laughs> August uh, of last year. And uh, the issue is called Microbes Maketh Man. And it talks about the human microbiome, the fact that there are millions of microbial genes inside each of our bodies. Uh, as, uh, as against the 25,000 human genes, and those microbial genes make up a very large part of what we are. Well, we'd sort of uh, tumbled on this about a decade ago, because I started playing um, in the late, uh, at the sunset of the 20th century, I started playing with the, the, the new software coming out for a computational microscope to look inside cells and look at molecules. And the microscope is made of chemistry, physics, maths, um, and, of course, supercomputers. And this is the type of thing that, that I was able to play with a decade ago. We took the genome of E. coli, and from that genome of E. coli, we extracted a protein which is on the right. The protein on the left is the human angiotensin II receptor. If you can see any real difference in them, I'll be quite surprised. But look, the other thing that's fascinating is that there is a drug docked into the binding pocket of these two receptors, that a human drug docks into the binding pocket of a bacterial receptor. Very interesting. The molecular mimicry, we developed the uh, concepts of the molecular mimicry. We uh, identified a key pathway, which is a nuclear receptor uh, called the, the VDR. Here, the... Um, VDR nuclear receptor, which is uh, responsible for at least a thousand genes, including some anti-metastasis genes. Um, and, and this is uh, dysfunctional with many of the um, common pathogens, MTB, EBV, CMV. So we, we figured out how we could use a drug that had already been approved to target that receptor and reverse some of the action of the microbes. Uh, by 2008, we reported uh, success at the International Congress in Autoimmunity in Porto. This is my colleague, Captain Tom Perez, just retired from 25 years at the US FDA, <laughs> Center for Drug Evalu Evaluation and Review. 
And Tom gave our report. Uh, there are about 103 patients on this graph with uh, indications from rheumatoid arthritis, uh, thyroiditis, uveitis, multiple sclerosis, um, uh, uh, um, and um, psoriasis, a number of different uh, diagnoses, and just about all of them were progressing fairly well at this point. It takes a long time for us to uh, reverse a chronic disease process, typically two to five years. By 2010, two years later, my colleague from Canada, Dr. Greg Blaney, uh, reported some case uh, histories of patients he'd been treating, uh, recovery from ankylizing spondylitis, autoimmune arthritis with Raynaud's, uh, a rheumatoid arthritis in aggressive form, and the end point he'd achieved was a return to work. This is using a retargeted, uh, already approved drug. And then almost immediately, um, a complaint was filed with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of British Columbia, his home uh, state, alleging that he wasn't adhering to standard of care. He spent weeks having to prepare a response, and his colleagues subsequently dismissed the complaint, saying that Dr. Blaney had properly used a rationale for the knowledge base and guidelines accessible in peer review medical literature, which are the rules. There was a standard set of rules for off-label prescribing, but it didn't stop him being attacked and have to waste all this time and uh, energy, I might add. It's uh, quite a lot of worry. However, a short distance away in Washington State, um, my uh, clinical collaborator, uh, uh, Dr. Schleifer, Susan Schleifer, um, was attacked by the State of Washington Medical Quality Assurance Commission, and they didn't want any concept of innovation. So in addition to publicly humiliating her um, by uh, uh, publishing her name and all the details, um, she was only allowed to keep her licence if she promised never to use any new science again, specifically each of the elements of the protocol that we'd developed, and if she hired a preceptor to double check or second guess all her decisions, diagnoses and prescriptions. But in Arizona, the uh, clinical collaborator there was arrested for child and vulnerable adult abuse and intent. After 18 months, he's still waiting for the case to come up before the court, and I can't comment any more on that. So what, what, what went wrong? I mean, 30 years ago when I was doing research, there was no pressure on physicians like this. When I was looking at the Nobel Prize um, for um, physiology and medicine. This photo was on the Nobel Prize uh, organization website and it shows Professor Robert Edwards, uh, the laureate on the left, with Leslie Brown, who was the uh, woman who was uh, inseminated, the first test tube baby. Um, then uh, the baby uh, is the next across and then her baby, uh, naturally uh, born, is, is in arms there. One happy family. That is what we used to have. Here is an old photo about 1982 of our research group, once again, infertility as it happens, uh, and, and the family is there, the, uh, the whole research group is there as one happy family. I wasn't there because I just migrated to the USA, but aside from that, <laughs> this was the way it used to be done. And the, uh, the, the scientific literature was used as a goal and, and the test for whether the standard of care was... Uh, something that, that uh, might be supplanted. These days, what happens is the uh, academic gets a good idea and has a protocol approved by an IRB, then investigators are selected by usually a pharma company. There's an approval process. Patient recruitment is done by some third parties that are hired at the least price. Data is then entered and reviewed. Statistical analysis is done, and only at that point does the data come back to the investigator. There is no way he can get feedback from the, the patient sitting there saying, Doc, I had a headache this morning. That's what's changed. And with this model, which is called evidence-based medicine, and good evidence-based medicine is very valuable, but what has been practiced by FDA for the last few years of placebo-controlled trial is not good evidence-based medicine, in my opinion. Because 
evidence-based medicine categorizes expert opinion, the physician's opinion, millions of physicians out there, many of them extremely competent, and it's categorized as the lowest form of medical evidence, superseded even by a bad clinical study. Well, what can we do about it? California did something. Uh, California brought in the um, AB 592 in 2005, uh, with this preamble, since the National Institute of Medicine has reported it can take up to 17 years for a new best practice to reach the average physician and surgeon, it's prudent to give attention to new developments, not only in general medical care, but in the actual treatment of specific diseases, particularly those that are not yet broadly recognised in California. A physician and surgeon shall not be subject to discipline solely on the basis that the treatment or advice he or she rendered to a patient is alternative or complementary medicine as long as that treatment or advice meets all of the following requirements. Is provided with informed consent. Is provided after the physician and surgeon has told the patient how he should be being treated. And uh, in the case of um, this uh, next writer, number three, was put in by the oncologist who uh, wanted to make sure that the uh, diagnosis wasn't going to be delayed by some of these uh, cancer therapies that you read about on the internet. Um, and, uh, and obviously it mustn't cause death or serious bodily injury. In just a few lines, just a few words, the, the physicians and the patients have been empowered in California and it has worked well. Thank you very much.